definitely more words have been added to my bio. Uh, okay, uh, the title, let me say a couple of things about the title. Okay, how Indians won the Silicon Valley, right? Number one, Silicon Valley is not a geographical entity. Silicon Valley is an idea. It basically denotes innovation. Innovation in many, okay. innovation in many technologies, but particularly uh, on innovations in digital technology. And Silicon Valley exists, you can say, wherever there are, uh, is a clusters of innovation, centers of innovation exist. So, of course, initially it started in the few kilometers area around San Jose, in the Bay Area, of the West Coast of the United States. But now, uh, many, many clusters of innovation in digital technology have come up and other technologies too, bio and uh, other, other technologies as well, in many other countries. So, that's what I want to say first, to explain the title, Silicon Valley is an idea. It has to do with innovation and digital technology. Second thing is description one. Okay, so it's a lot of hype. Uh, no, there was no race, and nobody has won it in that sense. Okay, uh, the title of this talk used to be Indian Con seminal Indian contributions to digital technology. But obviously, probably I would have had even. 20% of what I have here in this hall, if, I, if that was a title. So when I gave this talk in IIT Roorkee, the director at that time, I think it was Dr. Chaturvedi, he suggested that I should make the title more sexy. And that's how this title has come in. Okay, and now let me say a couple of more words about how I got into this, uh, uh, this uh, piece of history of reconstructing the history of digital technologies, starting with the birth of transistor in 1948 to the present, and also trying to locate what Indians have done in that of fundamental nature. Okay, the journey began with a, with a mission when I was a business journalist in Business India in the year 2000. So at that time, I think around spring of 2000. There was a, a small report in Fortune magazine. You might have heard of the name Fortune magazine, one of the important uh, business magazines in the uh, in United States. And that title of that report was Indian Mafia in the Silicon Valley. Okay? Leave aside the pejorative used in the title. It had basically talked about three, four individuals. So our publisher, Mr. Advani, Ashok Advani, he called a meeting and he told us, I am sure there are many more than these three, four. So why don't we go and explore who are the Indians who have done well as tech entrepreneurs okay, in the Silicon Valley. At that time, you know, the, there was a big uh, 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 rise in the uh, stock markets, NASDAQ particularly. Later it was ascribed to dot-com bubble, etc. But at that time, things were rising. And uh, any IPO was, uh, you know, becoming a multi-billion dollar IPO, etc. Many acquisitions were being made. Uh, in fact, uh, one Indian entrepreneur had just sold uh, three of his startups for 11 billion dollars. And this was in year 2000. Okay. So, we said, let's look at these tech entrepreneurs. Uh, who are these people? What have they done? What is the technology they have done, etc. And four of us, including a photographer, spent a month in the United States and traveling all over the United States. Because as I mentioned, Silicon Valley is, a, is an idea and not a geographical entity. So we started with Boston, New York, and Washington DC, and Dallas, and uh, uh, you know, Southern California, and all the way through Silicon Valley, all the way to Seattle, etc. And we ended up identifying about 70 individuals who had done extremely well as tech entrepreneurs. And we brought out almost a 200 page special issue of Business India. This is the cover page of that. So you can say the title also resonates with what I have used here. 
how Indians, how high tech Indians won the value. Then after that, it, it had excellent response from uh, corporate India and uh, you are from Silicon Valley, etc. And I received a, a mail from one of the top executives in the Tata Group, uh, Mr. Gopalakrishnan, R. Gopalakrishnan, but I heard his name. Uh, he uh, sent me a mail saying, very good, nice, uh, feel good stories, but what about fundamental contribution of Indians to technology and economy? Okay, these are all entrepreneurs. And by that time, within a few months, by the time it appeared, and within a quarter or so, the market crashed. And many billionaires became millionaires, and some millionaires became paupers also. Because most of this wealth is notional wealth, because these acquisitions are made in terms of stock, not cash. Most of the acquisitions are in stock. So if you hold the stock of a company which has acquired you, and that crashes, then you are in deep trouble. So many of these acquisitions had been made by, um, you know, all the big companies, Intel, and um, um, some by Microsoft, but Cisco, uh, at and and so on so forth, and uh, Lucent, uh, and so on. Uh, so when the, when the dot-com bubble burst, the telecom stocks also went for a toss. And uh, uh, many of these entrepreneurs, no uh, no also went down. So anyway, this was a valid, valid question, what have Indians done of a fundamental nature in technology? So I sent a proposal to the Tata Sons saying that I am ready to do research on this. This is a network I have, these are the venture capitalists I know, these are the entrepreneurs I know. And uh, we can search for the Indians who have done significant work in all the fundamental technologies which have created these present day products. Which means semiconductors, uh, microelectronics, uh, fiber optics, uh, lasers, optical networking, telecom, computing, and the internet. Okay, so all together under the umbrella of digital technology, what have Indians done in this? Let's search for that. And then situate them in the overall uh, story of the evolution of these technologies. And uh, the Tatas liked it, but of course they put the green tea for uh, three, four uh, uh, presentations, and uh, it went up to the highest uh, committee in the Tata group called the Group Executive Committee, headed by Mr. Ratan Tata. And uh, finally, they liked the idea and uh, took it upon themselves as part of the Tata Centenary, which was coming up in 2004. And this was 2002, when I had proposed it. And uh, uh, they said, fine, uh, now, uh, so I took a sabbatical from Business India for one and a half years, and worked on this project. Traveled, uh, I interviewed about 250 uh, technologists with my own research into IEEE transactions, IEEE awards, medals, ACM medals, etc., etc., and even uh, asked people who would you nominate. I called it Tech Oscars, just like Oscars are nominated by peer groups. I said, who would you nominate as people who are done fundamental work in your field, and so on. So through all these various means, I had to uh, put together a list. And uh, I set up appointments with them and traveled extensively in the, all the major universities and labs in the United States and uh, some in Canada and of course in India. And uh, finally, uh, I mean, I have 157 CDs of uh, audio interviews with them uh, and uh, sat down to writing, spent another four months uh, writing it up and then Tata Metroid published the first edition of the book, Santa Silicon. And this is a paperback edition which was published later uh, by uh, Rupa. And now I have put it on the web so you can download it free. The PDF copy is available. Okay, that is the archive.org address. Okay, so this is as far as the genesis of what I am going to tell you. Though what I am going to tell you, most of it is not in the book. It, uh, just a few uh, people's names are mentioned and the story of digital technology is told in the book. Okay. Now, this is the Kannada edition of that, which was published by Government of Karnataka in 2016. Digital Kranti Matu So, where I updated it also to, uh, to uh, look at some of the newer developments from 2004 to 2016. Now, let me start with, uh, not 1948, but about uh, maybe uh, a thousand or two thousand years before that. Okay. So I would like to uh, just splash, remind you of certain fundamental ideas which Indian thinkers developed, mathematicians, philosophers developed, which have had 
their uh, lasting print imprint on the present day digital technology. Okay, first idea is of course zero. Okay, zero as a as a part of decimal system, and of course people talk about zero in philosophy. People talk about zero in linguistics in Paninian grammar. People talk about zero in the in Pingala chandas and so on. But I am referring to zero in the decimal system, right? In the arithmetic system that Indians develop, and uh, <coughs> it's only when you try to add two numbers you understand the importance of zero and our decimal system. You try adding two numbers in the Greek Greek numbers, x's, b's, i, c, l, m, d, and you'll understand how difficult it is to do any arithmetic in, in the Greek system. And that's why they rarely did any arithmetic. They mostly did geometry. Okay? They thought, they imagined planes and, and curves and all sorts of things like that, rather than do numbers. Whereas, our people were more, uh, you can say, practical. So they were interested in counting, which is the literal translation of Ganita. Ganita means counting. Right? Counting is what is important for commerce. Counting is what is important for measurement. Counting is what is important for uh, many other things, right? Our daily lives. And then along with that, they developed the place value system for writing a number. What is the place value system? That means not only we have 0 to 9 as details, but then any larger number than 9, we express as, let's say 737. What does 737 mean? 700 plus 30 plus 7. But we write it as 737. That is 7 into 10 to the power 2, 3 into 10 to the power 1, and 7 plus 7 into 10 to the power 0. That means we are condensing that number, the idea of that number, to three coefficients in a polynomial with base 10. Okay? And you add that to, to with a concept of carryover and zero, then you can add to any two numbers. Doesn't matter even if they are 100 digit long. Right? So, this is of fundamental importance. Because after all, today, what does a computer do? It adds, right? It does nothing but add and subtract once you have the negative polarity. It can't even multiply, right? If you say 55 into 56, it will add 55, 56 times and get you the answer, but it does it so fast you think it will multiply, right? So, this is of fundamental importance. How do you add numbers and how do you get the correct answer? And this is what Pierre Laplace said about that. Pierre Laplace is considered one of the 20 greatest mathematicians that I have viewed. Okay? And if you look at them, he said, it is Hindus that gave us the ingenious method of expressing all numbers by means of 10 symbols. Each symbol receiving a value of position as well as an absolute value. An important and profound idea which appears so simple that we ignore its true merit. Now let me look at another idea. Again, I am throwing you some random ideas. It's not uh, an issue of logic. Now if you look at logic in the European sense, the Aristotelian logic <coughs> believes in two value logic. Right? True or false. The answer is true or false. Yes or no. Which converted to a Boolean algebra, Boolean system, you will say 0 and 1 which is what we use in our digital uh, technology and digital uh, computing, etc. Right? Binary logic is what we use, binary systems what we use. But you also know that while some questions in, in our life have yes or no answer, true or false answer, large major uh, number of questions do not have yes or no answer. They do not have zero and one answer. Okay? So, it's not black and white, but it is shades of grey. Many, many questions are answers which are in shades of grey. But binary logic, Aristotelian logic doesn't answer that. But interestingly, Indians thought about it at least a thousand years ago or more. Probably it is speculated that it was uh, Alexander found it when he came to India in the northwest of India. He found some Jain Munis 
and uh, the way they were discussing, uh, he uh, his Aristotelian uh, logicians could not understand. Then they said they are talking something which we don't understand because it is not Aristotelian logic. It was a multi-valued logic system which is called Shyamvad or Saptabhangi. That an, a question can have seven answers. Okay, and several scientists. So these are multi-valued logic systems. Now why am I talking about it? I'm talking about it though. In the, in the normal computing, we use only binary logic, true or false, zero, one. But uh, uh, electrical engineer in Berkeley University, and of Iranian origin, called Lotfi Zadeh, he came up with a system where the truth value can be anywhere between zero and one, not just zero or one. Okay, and that was called fuzzy fuzzy logic and fuzzy systems he developed. And when he talked about it, the chairman of his department is supposed to have said, this man has smoked cocaine or something like that. Okay? Because it is just alien to an American mind. But Zadeh said he got inspired by Eastern logicians. That is basically Jain and Buddhist logic, which uh, get read somewhere. But the people who immediately cast in on it and tried to use it by the Japanese. And Japanese put fuzzy logic into everything they created, microwaves and TVs and washing machines and everything, right? The Americans took a lot, lot more time to understand it. And in fact, they had to learn it the hard way. Uh, because, uh, I mean, this is, a, uh, this is an aside, but basically after the Iranian revolution, uh, none of you were born at that time, 1979, but in 1979-80, the Iranian uh, youth and several uh, who came to be known as Revolutionary Guards later surrounded the American Embassy, okay, and took the uh, people inside the American Embassy. They called it a CIA Center, etc., which probably it was. And there were about 300 people inside, and they held them hostage. Basically, what we used to call Gerao here, okay. And then uh, the the Americans could not take it, right? They didn't want to negotiate with this. So they, the uh, President Carter at that time was the President of the United States. He decided to send a commander unit to rescue them. So the commander unit went in three or four helicopters. And the plan was to land in the desert, Iranian desert, near Terra. And then they had some plan, operational plan, to go and rescue these people. But it never came to that. Because all the helicopters crashed in the desert. Okay? And then you had to rescue the commanders. Somehow they managed to come, them come back. And then when they analyzed it back, they realized that the control systems of those American military helicopters could not adapt themselves to the heat and dust of Iranian desert. And that's the first time Americans learned that there's something called adaptive controls, you know, which can maybe using fuzzy logic, etc. And then they took fuzzy logic seriously. Anyway, okay. Now let's look at some other ideas which are of ancient and uh, medieval origin. <coughs> Uh, now let's look at these mathematicians, Aryabhata, Brahmagupta, and Bhaskara. Bhaskara, the first Bhaskara, was contemporary of Brahmagupta. And uh, they, they, they developed uh, what today we call Bija Ganita, elements of that. Later, Bhaskara too developed it further. And uh, they also talked about how to solve a problem. One of the things they talked about is how to solve a problem. That is, you do this, you do this, you do this, you get answer. Okay, a step by step approach, right? Today, what we call it? Algorithm, right? And how did that word algorithm come into being? <coughs> it is because Muhammad Ibn, Ibn Musa al Khwarizmi, a mathematician who was a librarian in Khwarizmi, he is from Khwarizmi, so he is called Khwarizmi. Baghdad at that time was a great center of learning and intellectual format. So, there he, he studied the Indian mathematicians' books, and he wrote two books in Farsi, in Arabic. One was Kitab al Hisab al Hindi, the Indian method of reckoning, Indian method of calculating. Okay, and he introduced the Indian decimal system to the Arabs. And then he also wrote another book, Al Kitab al Muktasar fi Hisab al Jabr wal Mukabala. And when after the Crusades, the church was wondering, how are these pagan Arabs so advanced and all that? Maybe, you know, we should study what these Arabs have 
uh, have in their books and all that. So they set up a whole translation uh, system in a, a town called Toledo in Spain and translated as many Arab books as possible. And that's how they discovered Greek wisdom because Greek wisdom was lost in Europe, but the Arabs had preserved it. They had studied Aristotle, Plato, etc. Okay, so they had translated uh, Greek uh, stuff into uh, Arabic and they had also translated the Hindu texts. Okay, so when they translated al Khwarizmi's uh, book, they called it Algebra from Algebra. And the method that al Khwarizmi used, they called it al Khwarizmi's method. Though al Khwarizmi himself said, I learned it from the Indian mathematicians. Okay, so al Khwarizmi's method in Latin became Algorithmus, and today we call Algorithm. Which every day you get up like Ram Nam, you say algorithm, algorithm, algorithm. Right. <laughs> That's what, that is the origin of that. Okay. Now let's look at another uh, bunch of mathematicians. This is in the medieval India, all in Kerala, Madhava, Nilakanta Somayaji, and Jeshadeva. Starting from mid 14th century to late 16th century. They uh, developed today what is being called as pre calculus. And in fact, finally, they are being given uh, credit for the work they did because this was about 200 years before Newton, right? Newton and in Europe, the whole discussion was whether Newton invented calculus or Leibniz invented calculus, right? But 200 years before that, these guys had written down infinite series expansions of several trigonometric functions, sine, cosine, tan, arctan, etc which were exactly what you could get from Newtonian calculus later. So today now some of them, one of them is being called Mabadava series, etc. Et Earlier we used to know them as Taylor series, Maclaurin series and so many, uh, these, right, series expansions of these functions. So these people had written them down 200 years before that. So not, so this, this was a new concept. In fact, Professor Radham says that it was familiarity with some of these things, that is Indian algebra, which influenced Newton in writing his Principia, particularly the third volume, where he actually started calculating. Till that time, he was not calculating. That time, he started actually started calculating the orbits. You know, his gravitational law and orbits based on one over r squared, what would be the orbit, etc., elliptical orbits, etc., etc. Okay. But not only they talked about infinite series expansions, but they were in the certain domain. They were convergent series, right? So then in a convergent series, what do you do? You don't add 100 terms or 1000 terms and so on, right? Infinite, you cannot do anyway. So it depends on the accuracy you want. You want accuracy of two decimal places, three decimal places, four decimal places, or whatever you are calculating. Let's say you are calculating the value of pi, okay? Many people will stop at 3.14. Somebody will say 3.141519 and so on and so forth, right? So it depends where you want to stop. <laughs> so after a certain number of turns, depending on your the decimal place you want, the accuracy you want, you to stop. But what does that mean? That means because it's a convergent series, the remaining is negligible. Okay, remaining amount is negligible. That means you cut off, you round off, right? And that is exactly what you follow when you do computation. Because you know that almost all problems in engineering and physics and chemistry and everything, whatever you want to compute, they are not they are not solvable analytically. Physicists like me are very arrogant, right? They think their science is fundamental. But you ask a physicist, what can you solve exactly analytically? There are only two problems they can solve. One is simple harmonic oscillator, the other is hydrogen atom. <laughs> Whether it is classical mechanics or quantum mechanics. That is a two body problem or a simple harmonic oscillator. You give them a three body problem, a hydrogen molecule or a helium atom, they will not be able to solve exactly. You will have to do approximations, perturbation theory, etc. Et et okay? So, when you have to do these computations and you don't have analytical solutions, then you have to follow the method of cutting off somewhere, depending on the accuracy you want, and uh, 
taking it to the nearest integer, the last digit, right? That is what is called zeroism, and in fact, that is what you use in numerical methods in, in doing computation, right? So these are just I'm sprinkling a few ideas to you uh, to remind you that there is a lot in the ancient and medieval Indian mathematics and philosophy which has relevance to how we think today, how we solve problems today. Now let's get to 20th century or at least late 19th century. Okay, Though the transistor was invented in 1948, the first person to take out a patent on a semiconductor device was our own Jagdish Chandra Bose. Most people think Jagdish Chandra Bose talked about feelings of plants, you know, responses of plants to stimuli, neurobotany, etc., etc., right? Which is true, he did. But even he also created a field which today we call microwave engineering. Because Hertz had shown that Maxwellian electromagnetic waves right, exist. But he actually created the device which can not only transmit a radio wave but also receive it. And the device which he created to receive it, which was called at that time iron mercury coherer, was, a, was his own invention. And he showed it publicly in Calcutta, then he went to London and showed it to Royal Society and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, it was these ideas which were picked up by Marconi and used it in his radio. And Marconi got the Nobel Prize, but posted it. And there are at least half a dozen Indians like that, whose ideas <coughs> led to others' work, which they got the Nobel Prize and not the Indians. I mean, that's another story. We'll talk about it some other time. And when he was in the, in the hotel he was staying, one American, you can call him venture capitalist if you want, came to him and he said, Professor, you'll have to patent this device, what you have created. And Bose said, what is, what is this patent? I don't know and I don't understand. Then he forced him into it. So the first device, solid state device, which was ever patented was by Jagdish Chandra Bose. That was applied in 1901 and the patent was granted in 1904. And in fact, Sir Neville Mott, who got the Nobel Prize for his work in semiconductor physics in 1978, most of his work was in early 50s. He said somewhere, I not got the exact uh, quotation of that, but he said that probably Bose was 60 years ahead of his time. That means what we talked about n-type and p-type semiconductors, etc. in 1950s and 40s, Bose probably saw it in 1890s. Now, more modern. This is uh, Jayant Paliga, IIT Madras. And uh, he went to do his PhD in the Rensselaer Polytechnic. Rensselaer Polytechnic, by the way, is one of the oldest engineering colleges in the US. Okay, though it's called a polytechnic, don't think that people go there to get a diploma. Okay, and there, his guide was another Indian, who was also a remarkable physicist, uh, engineer called Saurabh, uh, Saurabh Gandhi, a Parsi. And Saurabh Gandhi, in fact, his claim to fame, one of his contributions is that after the transistor was introduced by Bell Labs in 1948, how to use a transistor, what can we do with it as a semiconductor transistor, right, was uh, up for debate. In fact, when Bell Labs gave a press conference in 1948 in New York introducing the transistor, the, the uh, journalist asked the Bell Labs representative, Ki, what is, okay, very good and all that, what is its use? And the Bell Labs guy didn't know what to say. So he said, well, uh, maybe you can use it in this hearing aids. Okay? So that tells you something, that creators of technology most probably don't know how that technology is going to develop and evolve and be used. Okay, so many times people ask me, what do you think about AI, what will happen with chat GPT, this and that. I say, my business is not any kind of Jyotish here. I'll tell you what has happened before and I'll try to report on that. Because forecasting technology has always been almost, is the most hazardous thing. Because, you know, I can give you any more uh, number of examples of inventors of technology who just could not predict how it would be used. For example, I include Jack Kilby who invented the IC and he got the Nobel Prize for it in 2000. And he said, that when he invented the first chip, uh, he uh, 
So when Kilby uh, showed it to uh, senior executives and Texas Instruments where he was working, they said, okay, this is very nice. It is, uh, you know, it is uh, producing a very good response, sinusoidal response. You put a sine wave inside and you get amplified sine waves used as an amplifier, right? Very good. We can get an amplifier with this microchip, germanium-based microchip. Then they asked him, okay, what is its use? Because Texas Instruments those days was creating gauges, pressure gauges and so on and so forth for the oil industry in Texas. That's why the name Texas Instruments. It was not an electronics <coughs> company, which it became later. Okay. So he said, well, maybe I can create a 4-bit calculator. So the original chip inventor thought he, that he can make a calculator to add uh, uh, numbers with it. And now we know uh, where chips are and where they are reached and what all the areas they cover. Right? So anyway, so coming back to this, uh, uh, Saurabh Gandhi wrote the first textbook ever on how to, uh, on analyzing transistor circuits. That was in 1951-52. And Jayant Palaga went to uh, do PhD with him in the early 70s, 72 or 73 from, after uh, doing his B.Tech in IIT Madras. <coughs> and uh, there, by that time, uh, Saurabh was also one of the uh, pioneers in working on compound semiconductors, <coughs> gallium arsenide and several others, okay? And he worked under him. And then later he joined GE, General Electric's uh, R&D Center in Schenectady in upstate New York. And there he created a new type of transistor. So far we have, we have in the chip industry, in electronics, we have been trying to create smaller and smaller transistors, right? The first transistor was about this big. You can see a photograph probably, go into the internet and you'll see. And you can see uh, Jackson Peace chip, that is also about this big. You can see it in the... Um, uh, internet again. But now we are going into nanometer, right? Nanometer size um, uh, transistors. Why is that? Because of mobility, we want uh, lesser power consumption, we, are, we want lesser heat dissipation issues, right? And we want it uh, all into mobile devices and then we know, we always complain, right? My battery is not good enough, my mobile is out, out right? I need to recharge it. So the lesser the power my device can use, the better it is. And that will happen if I reduce the amount of current that the, my transistors are handling. So from amperes to milliamperes to microamperes and so on and so forth, right? So, but there are also large number of applications where you need to use very large currents, thousands of amperes, even millions of amperes. Say for example in the, in the uh, Shinkansen, the, the bullet train, and many power power electronics applications. In fact, one application which you must have seen in television serials or in real life is the is a paddle which doctors use to revive a person who has had a heart attack, right? Defibrillator. So in all these instruments, the transistors he invented called IGBT, integrated gate bipolar transistors. IGBTs are used, and now it is a multi-billion dollar industry. Next person I want to flash is Umesh Mishra, young Umesh Mishra. Uh, now he's no longer young, but definitely younger than me. Uh, from IIT uh, Kanpur, he's now uh, leading a researcher in gallium nitride. And gallium nitride has many, many applications in defense, in high frequency applications, in radar, and, and even base stations, telecom base stations, etc. Okay? He is at the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara now. Uh, then let's look at chips. Pallav uh, Chatterjee from IIT Kharagpur, gold medalist from there, 1972 or 73. He uh, uh, went to US and later he got a job in te Texas Instruments and he did outstanding work in, in improving the technology of chip making into what is called uh, uh, submicron trenching. <coughs> okay, so that not only you have planner uh, devices, but you can build multi-story buildings. You can even build basements and so on and so forth, okay? That is part of his contribution for which he was recognized. And also not only that, in the 1980s, uh, the, the Japanese semiconductor industry suddenly moved ahead of the Americans. They started producing cheaper and better chips. And those days it was mostly memory chips. And uh, <clears throat> so the American government got worried and uh, the industry got worried how the Japanese have moved ahead of us. 
right? So they appointed a committee of which uh, he was a member and also another Indian, Professor Krishna Saraswat in Stanford University, he was a member and these two con contributed significantly to figuring out what the Japanese had done and uh, which made them, you know, which put them ahead of Americans. And uh, as a result of that report, later American semiconductor industry also adopted new manufacturing practices. I don't have the time to now go into that, but basically that again, US uh, semiconductor industry got the fourth position after that. Uh, you know Dham, you must have heard his name. He is known as father of Pentium. Right? But don't ever believe if media says somebody is father of something or mother of something. Because nobody is a father or mother of any technology. Even in that, we say maybe in Edison's time and Bell's time and, uh, and so on, uh, you know, they created this technology, Faraday, this is a created this technology, that technology. But even those are controversial because there are many people who have filed patents or published papers or had made devices which later we came to know that they had also they were also working simultaneously on that. But today it is almost impossible to say XYZ is a is a father or a mother of something. Because any new idea, even if you take a patent on it, first of all it's teamwork. And even if you take a patent on it, uh, very soon the patent is analyzed and there will be many other groups uh, you know working on it. And within days there will be rears fierce competition and sometimes collaboration and cooperation. So it takes hundreds and sometimes thousands of people for, for developing a technology. Okay? But Vinod Dham was the general manager of the project to produce Pentium in Intel and Pentium is still even today the highest selling chip, uh, microprocessor chip from Intel. Uh, Dham by the way studied in uh, Delhi College of Engineering. Dham told me another story which is interesting. Uh, because nowadays we talk about FAPs in India and all that, FAPs are coming and all that. But in, in the mid 60s, Robert Noyes came to India. He was still working in Fair, Fairchild. Robert Noyes, you know, established Intel, was one of the founders of Intel. He came to India, stayed 15 days in Delhi and he was trying to convince the Indian government that if he is given certain, certain concessions, etc., he will establish, semiconductor, start the semiconductor industry in India. And we don't know the details of what went on, but basically it did happen. And we lost out and all that went to East Asia. But the MG Communion, the person in charge of electronics at that time? Uh, <coughs> this was early 60s, so it, it's still Homi Baba. Uh, still be Homi Baba. Uh, somewhere between 63, 65, that date is yet to be confirmed. But this, because he stayed with the uh, owner of the, uh, one of the well-known semiconductor devices companies in India called Continental Devices. Okay, so the story has been told by the owner of the Continental Devices about this, uh, which has been recorded by a couple of journalists. And to me, Dham told me that story. Now, uh, this is Atik Raza, a Pakistani uh, chip uh, uh, engineer, and uh, uh, we're a great friend of India and Indians. Uh, he's now in Silicon Valley, one of the leading uh, uh, venture capitalists as well, as well as an innovator in uh, chip technology. Uh, and uh, because of his uh, liberal and reformist views, he had to run away from Zia Lut uh, Pakistan. Uh, but he, then there was a loss for Pakistan. He settled down and he's a major force in, uh, uh, in Silicon Valley chip industry. And it was the, the <coughs> startup which he was heading called Next Gen, which uh, was acquired by AMD because NextGen came with a technology which could have improved AMD's chips. And when AMD acquired it and AMD uh, owner, uh, CEO allowed him to, um, made him the VP engineering and all that, that is when AMD first time became a major force and started challenging Intel. And now recently he was telling me that that team which was in AMD earlier, which came from NextGen actually, now has joined NVIDIA and you know now where NVIDIA is. Reached a two trillion dollar uh, uh, market cap. Right? Okay, now I'm going to flash faces of a few individuals uh, who actually made uh, separated. You can say helped in separating chip design from chip fabrication. Right? <coughs> Today, chip design is you don't have to be in a, fabri in a uh, chip fabrication unit to design a chip, you can sit in Hyderabad, you can sit in Pune, Bangalore, Delhi, wherever you want and uh, design the cutting edge chips. 
Okay, uh, and that is possible because of all the EDA tools you have, electronic uh, design automation tools, right? Now, the, the three four individuals I am going to flash. So, as Patel from IIT Kharagpur, later did his PhD uh, from MIT. Uh, Prabhu Goel from IIT Kanpur, uh, who went to CMU and later joined IBM, uh, and. Uh, Rajveer Singh, he was the one I was telling you about, very simple person, but he is the one who sold his startups for 11 billion dollars in 2000. Okay, he wrote the first book on VHDL. Right? What is VHDL? How many people know? Ah, good. Uh, very long hardware design language, right? So he was he was the first one to write a book on that. And then, uh, of course, Vinod Khosla, you can see. Because Vinod Kosla actually wanted to uh, create software for designing chips. But then he found, so he established a company. Uh, he had just finished his uh, MBA from Stanford University. Uh, he's from IIT Delhi. Uh, and he went and did biomedical in CMU. And then he went to Stanford for a business degree. And there uh, uh, he was trying, thinking about uh, ideas to start uh, to do chip design software and uh, all that. Okay. So, but then he found, he started a company called Daisy Systems. <coughs> then he found that even if they create the software and the tools, there are not enough desktop workstations with which they could do anything. Okay? This was 1980-81. So, he along with three other of his friends started a company called Sun Microsystems, which became a very, very powerful force. And unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore. I think now it's a part of Oracle. But Sun Micro at one time was one of the leading uh, computer companies and created all these powerful workstations, then later <coughs> system graphics, etc. And they were the workstations which were used for uh, chip design. Now, of course, he's one of the top uh, venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. Uh, Janak Patel from MS University, Baroda. He's in the uh, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, no, uh, University of Illinois at uh, Urbana Champagne, and uh, he created, he's not a chip engineer, but he understood the logic and so on. So he created the algorithm to check whether a design will work or not. And this is very, very important, because today we are talking about chip, chip fabrication and all that, right? Chip fabs and all that. Okay, that's very, very necessary. But that is for a different reason. That is for more for strategic reason and some other reason. But if you look at the value, value content in a chip, I have been told by experienced people like Mr. Kohli, Fakirchand Kohli, who was the founder of TCS, that 80% of the value of the chip is in design and in testing. Only 20% is in actual manufacturing. Okay? So, <coughs> testing is very important. If you, you have designed it and you, all designers think that design will work, right? But unless you test it and show, make sure that the design will deliver the functionality for which it was designed, then uh, uh, it will be a big loss. Because once you go into manufacturing and put it into the fab and then suddenly see 50% loss, 40% loss, they are not delivering the functionality, then naturally the cost per chip will go up and you can't compete in the market. So his algorithm was immediately picked up by Intel and Motorola who were the uh, biggest uh, uh, processor man uh, <coughs> manufacturers at that time uh, to do that testing etc. Okay, now I'm going to talk about a slightly different thing, that how technology has advanced by using psychology. Okay, now actually psychology has played a major, major role in technology, in development of technology. We don't realize it, we think, you know, a lot of engineering and maths and all that will lead to great technology. It does, but there is a limit to that, especially when you are human interface. When human beings are going to be users, it depends on how humans perceive a sound or a picture or etc. etc. And based on that, you can develop new technology. In fact, by the way, two of the founders of artificial intelligence were psychologists. Newell and Simon. One was even an economist. He got a Turing Award and also got a Nobel Prize in Economics at Carnegie Mellon. Okay? The person who headed the DARPA's project to create computer networking which led to internet, at that time it was called ARPANET, was also a psychologist called John Licklider. And the person who took over from him, 
who actually implemented the ARPANET project. And later he was hired by Xerox and to create a new lab in Palo Alto called Palo Alto Research Center called PARC, short form, which created the mouse, word processing, laser printer, Windows, C++, you know, object-oriented programming and so on. PARC developed it. Later, of course, Microsoft and Apple <laughs> used their, uh, their ideas. And Xerox got nothing but the laser printer. Of course, they made a billion dollars with laser printer, so they should be happy. But uh, the person who led both these, ARPANET implementation and Xerox PARC, was also a psychophysicist called Bob Taylor. And I, and I met him and I interviewed him. Now, so psychology plays a major role in the development of technology. And the first one I want to mention is none other than our boss. Amar Bose uh, is not that way strictly only Indian. His father was Indian. Uh, his father's name was Nonigopal Bose, who was a revolutionary in Bengal uh, and in the early 20th century. And he was being uh, chased by British CID. So to escape them, he went in a ship which was going to the United States and landed up in the United States, penniless. And then he managed to reach Philadelphia and settled down there and started a small uh, radio repair shop. And he married an American lady, and uh, Amar Bose was her child. And Amar Bose was brilliant. So despite growing up in all this poverty, he learned all his electronics by fiddling around with all the radio sets in his uh, father's uh, repair shop. And uh, later, uh, he did very well in school, etc. And uh, he got into MIT. And in MIT, <coughs> after doing brilliantly in BTEC, he wanted to do his PhD. And all the senior professors in MIT pushed him to take Norbert Wiener as his guide. Now, Norbert Wiener was one of the, again, one of the 20 great mathematicians, his name comes in. Okay? Great mathematician. Uh, he's also called father of cybernetics. Right? But, nobody could understand what Wiener was talking, or writing, or his method of thinking. So, that's why they were pushing Bose to go and work with him. And, uh, this is what Bose told me. I had a number of conversations with him. And he said that uh, he also could not understand anything and after a year he was ready to give up. And he told the chairman, I had enough, I can't understand what this man is saying or writing or talking. He talks very little and uh, so I'll give him. <laughs> then suddenly it came to him, what logic, what is the process, the way the winner is working. And then everything became clear to him. Then he quickly within a year or two he finished his PhD and everybody <laughs> applauded that. Okay, the other one person who understood winner. <coughs> Now, Amar, so Wiener was a great friend of India, by the way. And he was a friend of Malnobis and uh, various other people in India. Uh, Malnobis at that time had set up the Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta. Okay, a uh, great mathematician. You know, you must have heard about him, at least because if you have seen the movie about Ramanujan, uh, the mathematician, Srinivas Ramanujan, he was also a contemporary of him in Cambridge. Okay. Now, uh, so Wiener told him, uh, you will get a faculty position in MIT, no doubt, but before that spend one year uh, in India. Try to go to India and spend one year. So he spent six months in Calcutta with uh, Malno Base and gave some seminars, etc. And six months with Krishnan in uh, National Physical Laboratory in Delhi. And that time one of the things he was wondering, he was a great, uh, uh, also a very good uh, 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 violinist, Western classical music. Okay. So, he was very keen on audio and he found that none of the audio equipment that is available in the market could reproduce the concert hall experience. So, he said, I was looking for concert hall experience. So, that time it was called Hi-Fi. Hi-Fi had come new, right? Today, what do you call Hi-Fi? Anything fashionable, right? But Hi-Fi means high fidelity. Fidelity to the original. That is exact reproduction of the original. Okay, loyal to the original. That is high fidelity. So, it was supposed to reproduce the original sound. But he found that it was not doing that at all. The best of the equipment did not was not doing that. So, that was bothering him. How do I create this? Then he thought of later, with all this mathematics and electrical engineering, when it was not leading him anywhere, he said, let us see how people perceive sound. So, that is a field called psychoacoustics. He studied psychoacoustics and applied those principles and his mathematics and electrical engineering to create what became the biggest audio brand in the world. Not Philips, not Sony, but Bose. Okay. 
Uh, and in fact, he used to give a course on psychoacoustics uh, in MIT. And people say that uh, his lecture in the, in the lecture hall uh, used to be, didn't have even standing space. The lecture hall, the biggest lecture hall in MIT didn't have standing space when Bose was lecturing on psychoacoustics. It was the most popular course in uh, MIT places. Anyway, next one is Arun Netravali from IIT Bombay. In fact, he's from uh, Karwar. He studied in a, uh, Karwar in Karnataka and then later his family had moved to Mumbai and they came from a very uh, modest family, lower middle class family. So he studied in a municipal school in Mumbai and then got into IIT Bombay. He got the President's gold medal in IIT Bombay, went to Rice University, did his PhD and joined the Bell Labs. Right? And later he became the President and Chief Scientist of Bell Labs and so on got the National Technology Medal. In the US, uh, they value the National Technology Medal, uh, President's Medal, they call it, and President Science Medal as the highest honor. Okay, uh, so he received that also, and even our government gave Badhubhushan, etc. And uh, he worked a lot in uh, video and uh, uh, analysis, okay. So he was part of the, he led the standards committee in JPEG and MPEG standards. Okay, and they also created uh, what today we call HDTV, High Definition TV. It is his team which created that. Okay, and they demonstrated it in 1984 in Los Angeles Olympics. And of course, it took another 15-20 years for it to come to the market. Right? So what does that tell us? It tells us that even if you have a great technology, great product, doesn't mean it, it can come to the market and become a success just like that. Because there are things beyond technology when it comes to market. There is politics. Okay? There is politics of the industry and politics of the nations. Japan wants its own standard. Europe wants its own standard. America has its own standard. Right? How will they all agree? You have to make them all agree to one standard. You have to ask the broadcasters to agree to their standard. You have to ask the equipment manufacturers, TV manufacturers to uh, adopt that standard. Only then that will become a product. So it took another 15-20 years for HDTV to come into being in our homes and Arunetravali led that whole effort. And again he used perception studies. Okay, how can we uh, send video signal? Those days of course it was no, no, we didn't have this uh, broadband internet etc. etc. This is, I am talking the, you know, 70s and 80s, right? So you had to send it through cable and even uh, laser uh, optical networking had not come into being. It was still very experimental. So you have to send it through copper. Through copper, all you can send is, you know, uh, 64 kbps, which is what you call run quality. So then, what can you do? You can use coaxial cable. Okay, it will increase it. But you needed minimums. They found 70 MB bandwidth to send a video signal. So how can you crunch it? So they had used all the signal processing methods, and they could not do it. Then he started thinking about perception studies. How do people look at a picture? Suppose somebody is sitting on a lawn. Are they interested in the person's head and neck or are they interested in each blade of grass and so on. So what can be re retained and what can be discarded or what can be low res and what can be a good resolution picture and so on and so forth. So all these studies they use to create uh, finally uh, uh, the technology for high definition TV. So again you can say psychology and consumer behavior uh, also uh, played a role in this. The other one example is uh, Nikhil Jain. Uh, he again, he's a PhD from ISC. Okay, in fact, there are a number of at least three people I'm going to uh, quote who are all PhDs from ISC because ISC was one of the first universities in the world which started a, a course uh, in signal processing and which became later communication engineering, etc. <coughs> and all of them talked a lot about one of the professors there called B.S. Ramakrishna. And many times when you talk about these products, that is, the products of our educational institutions, we forget the teachers who created them. Like Professor Raja Raman in IIT Kanpur, Professor Mahavala in uh, IIT Madras, uh, Hari Sahasrabhudde in uh, Kanpur and then Bombay and Pune and so on. So, the, uh, Professor Nori in IIT Kanpur, uh, many such, Professor Narsiman in TIFR, these were the people, not only they did fantastic work in their own fields, but they created the human resources which has made today, who made all these contributions. So we should never forget the teachers who created <coughs> these. And uh, Nikhil Jain, uh, he also joined, uh, after his PhD, joined Bell Labs, and he was heading the uh, 
signal processing unit again, and they are looking at audio. And uh, it was his group which uh, actually developed the technology for MP3. And what they discovered, of course, the patent was done by was uh, owned by another person, a German, who was also working in the group, who had come on a uh, exchange basis, I think, from uh, Max Planck Institute. Uh, but it is this group which developed MP3, and the philosophy of MP3, what they found is that they had used all the compression techniques, okay, to crunch the uh, the audio signal, to still retain high quality. So can you get CD quality sound? That time CD quality sound was supposed to be the best, right? Now nobody uses CD. You just talk about uh, uh, MP3 or uh, streaming and all that, right? Uh, but that time. A CD quality sound, how do you reproduce that? How do you send it through copper wire and so on? So how do you compress it? So they had reached the limits of compression. Then they said, let's look at how the human ear perceives sound. And they found that actually human ear is sensitive to only 10% of the frequencies in a signal. Okay. So now the trick was to identify that 10% and filter out the rest. Then immediately you achieved a 10x compression. Right? And that is the secret of MP3. That is what he is demonstrating here when in his photograph. Uh, he is now in Georgia Tech. Now let's look at another person. And this person we, should, we can call father. Father of something. That is Narendra Singh Kapani. He was a... Um, he created fiber optics. He is the father of fiber optics. And he even coined the word fiber optics. First time. So he was a uh, young uh, student in Dehradun. Uh, his father was working, I think, in the ordnance factory. Uh, and then he did one year, uh, after his B.Sc. in physics, he did one year, uh, spent one year doing internship in the ordnance factory. Then he got a chance to go to Imperial College to do a diploma, which he later converted into PhD, physics. And the, the one problem which he was worrying about from his school and college days was, can light be bent? Okay. Why should light go only in a straight line? Now, of course, everybody knows light bends in a prism, right? So he tried to build prism systems and so on, but then you found that uh, not only there is dispersion, but there is actually such a big signal loss that nothing may be seen on the other side, right? So, uh, but he wanted to pursue it further. So then, when he went to Imperial College, uh, Dr. Hopkins, the person who was standing behind him, this is the lab where he was working, in Imperial College, London, that Dr. Hopkins, every hospital, right? What is it called? Scopy. Colonoscopy, laparoscopy, right? Endoscopy. So he used it for that. In fact, his patent says that, that this will be used, this will have medical applications. Then you know there have been Nobel Prizes in medicine given to people who have developed CT, CT scan uh, and all this, <coughs> tomography, etc., right? So maybe he should have been given at least a medical uh, Nobel for inventing that. But he didn't get that. And he also has a distinction of using laser for the first time for an eye surgery, which he did in Stanford University Hospital in 1966. Just then the ruby laser was invented and he was the first one to use a laser for eye surgery. Uh, anyway, there are many stories you can tell about each individual. So I don't think I'll run out of time very fast. I'm already uh, running late. Desh Deshpande uh, did uh, a lot of fundamental work in, uh, in uh, he's from IIT Madras and then went to Queens uh, in Canada and then uh, joined Motorola and then did a lot of work in data networking and then also in optical networking. Um, and then, in fact, one of the uh, most successful Indian startups today we talk about, which in deep technology is Pages Networks, and he's the one who founded it and chaired it uh, and mentored it. Uh, okay, now let me talk about internet briefly. Abhay Bhushan from IIT Kanpur, uh, I think uh, 69 or 70 batch, he went to MIT to do his master's and there ARPANET was just coming into being. So he created the, the standard for sending a message from one computer to another. Today we call it email. So he sent the first email and he used uh, file transfer protocol FTP for that. Later of course people changed it to SMTP and uh, uh, so on. Okay. Oops. Now, now <coughs> this is Pradeep Sindhu, 74 batch from IIT Kanpur. Uh, then he actually uh, looked at uh, routers and he found that Cisco's routers, this was in the 90s, mid 90s. 
uh, okay, uh, he had gone through several uh, other things before that. I think he was working in Park also before that, the Palo Alto, Xerox <coughs> Park Center I was telling you about. And then he got this idea that the current routers which Cisco was marketing at that time was not good enough. It was not based on internet protocol. So he, he, he created a totally new router which could, at, in those days gigabit routers were big, right? Today we need terabyte routers, right? So, but that was big and so he thought of it, Vinod Kosla funded him as a venture capitalist and he created a startup called Juniper Networks which took on Cisco and became one of the most successful internet infrastructure companies. And just two weeks back it was acquired by HP uh, for 14 billion dollars. But uh, it was a very successful uh, uh, networking company. Okay? But his contribution is mainly on emphasizing internet protocol in the background. <coughs> Yogen Dalal. 1973 back from IIT Bombay, okay, and he went to Stanford to do his PhD, and there he and another graduate student, Carl Sunshine, were working with a professor who is a legendary professor in uh, uh, internet, uh, this thing, called Wint himself. So Wint sir, Carl Sunshine, and Yogen Dalla wrote the first, uh, you know, RFC or the standards for today what we call TCPIP, Transfer Control Protocol Internet Protocol. That is the basis of internet, right? How diverse networks can still talk to each other. Okay, that is the basis of internet. That is the literal meaning of internet. Different networks talking to each other. Right, one may be uh, like uh, uh, Hawaii, they had built a uh, you know, wireless network. Okay, local area network. Then somewhere else, some ethernet based uh, network. Somewhere else, some other network and all that. But how do all these networks talk to each other? How do they exchange data and files? And that is the basis of internet. So TCPIP is the basis of that, and he was one of the authors of that. Okay, AI, uh, I have only uh, two, three names here. Uh, Professor R. Narsimhan, uh, he is a distinction, he is uh, a fundamental work in pattern recognition uh, in TIFR. Uh, he is actually a mathematician, and then uh, he was recruited by Baba, and uh, the first thing, Baba told him is, can you create a digital computer? Because Baba had heard about digital computer, which was created by one Naman in Houston during the Second World War, which was used actually to do atomic bomb calculations and all that. If you have seen the Open Naman movie, you might have heard about that, one Naman's work. But, <coughs> so Baba wanted in TIFR to take a leap into digital electronics. So he called uh, 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 Professor Nasiman and said, you know, you have to develop a digital computer. Now, Narsimhan was a mathematician, he was not an electronics engineer. So, he got four other people who were MSc physics and they were new electronics, but who had never seen a computer. He at least had seen a computer in his PhD work in the US. He had used it as a mathematician only for numerical methods. So, these five people created the first digital computer in India in 1954 called TIFRAC, TIFR Advanced Computer. And at that time, it was as good as, you know, other computers in the world. But at that time, unfortunately, TIFR didn't have a proper campus. It was still working through barracks and some uh, company which belong, some uh, building uh, in Malabar Hills which belonged to Baba family and so on and so forth. Okay. So, we didn't have air conditioning. So, two more years they had to wait to get an air conditioned place to test it out. Of course, it worked well. By that time, of course, industry moved ahead and so on. But Diffrac was the computer on which many people learned computing in India, originally. Okay? Uh, and Professor Nasiman, of course, uh, he was a mathematician. So Baba told him they were studying cosmic rays, uh, cloud chamber photographs and uh, so on, and bubble chamber photographs, etc. So he said, how do we understand these patterns of these, these, uh, these uh, particles? Okay? Uh, so, to solve that problem, he got into pattern recognition and did fundamental work in that. Uh, and then, of course, he did many other things later. Um, other person I want to mention is Rajagadi. Many of you in Hyderabad might have seen him, or at least you can uh, pick up his, some of his lectures on YouTube. Uh, he is the only uh, Indian so far who has received the Turing Award. Turing Award is the Nobel Prize of Computer Science. Okay? And he got it for his work in artificial intelligence. And what did he do? Is BTEC in civil engineering? Okay. 
Then he went to Australia, and from Australia, then he did his master's in something. Then he went to Stanford and joined a PhD program. And Stanford in 62 or so, around that time, was planning to develop the systems for a robotic vehicle on the surface of Mars. Can you understand this? How strategically people think in research. In 62, I don't think Americans even had sent a man in, uh, around the earth. Forget about going to Mars. But already Stanford was working on what later came to be known as Pathfinder, etc. A robo robotic vehicle on the surface of Mars. How, how it will you know, negotiate the ditches and the rocks and all that. So, computer vision and so on. Okay. So, uh, and uh, how will it... Uh, uh, so, for that reason, artificial intelligence in computer vision, etc. they were working on. So, he joined that group. Later, he worked on speech. And, uh, and uh, it is for his work in artificial intelligence that he was given the... Uh, uh, this is Arvind Joshi from Pune uh, at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. He did fantastic work, position work in the what is today called uh, computational linguistics or understanding uh, you know, uh, natural language processing and so on. Okay, this is a uh, I don't want to get into it. Uh, you have uh, Professor uh, Vidyasagar uh, here and so on who have worked on the language, on artificial intelligence, on robotics. Uh, so, you can have lectures by him uh, later, but I think she did foundation work. In fact, uh, Rajiv Sangal, who later interplayed in Hyderabad, uh, did a lot of work on uh, Indian language uh, computing and uh, developing the uh, translation, machine translation, etc. was a PhD student of Arun Joshi. Okay, and uh, I think Professor Yagnarayan, who also worked a lot in uh, speech, also knew Arun Joshi and worked with him in this <coughs> Okay, now I, uh, this is something uh, I want to spend a couple of minutes on. Okay, this is Indian Software Engineering and IT Services. Okay, so I'm going to flash a few names. FC Kohli, Fakir Chand Kohli, who, who by the way is not a computer scientist. Okay, he established TCS, but he was a power engineer. So, so he has many, many, in fact he became an IEEE fellow for his work in power engineering. And a paper which he wrote uh, in the IEEE journal, which became the foundational uh, paper for today what we call Power Grid Corporation. Okay? Uh, how to use high voltage uh, uh, transmission systems, etc. But he is, you can say, though he didn't found it, but he actually led to the uh, development and growth of TCS. JRD Tata moved him from Tata Electric to TCS. And he did a lot of work in other things. But TCS, uh, in TCS, Goli, and then later Ramgore, uh, then uh, I'm going to show some others. Uh, P.P. Gupta in CMC, okay, uh, Computer Maintenance Corporation, later came to be known as CMC. Uh, these are some of the people who led the foundation of foundation of software engineering, and the key to the success of Indian IT is software engineering. Okay, I'll explain to you what it is. Keshav Nori, again from IIT Bombay, later he taught in IIT Kanpur, TIFR, and also joined TCS. And he led the software engineering work in TCS. Okay? Uh, Narayan Murthy in Infosys, uh, Nandan Nilekini in Infosys, and later other projects. So, P.P. Gupta, uh, most, most of you I am sure don't know it. Uh, I want to mention that, others you might have heard of at least. P.P. Gupta was the one who changed India's mind about computers. Because he created the uh, computerized reservation system for Indian Railways. Okay? And he convinced Indian Railways, uh, the chairman, and he convinced, of course, Sam Petroda and Rajiv Gandhi, who backed him at that time, which led to sea change in Indian, Indian attitude towards computers. Till that time, people were afraid. There was political opposition. Unions were opposed to it. People also didn't know what computers meant. They said, we already have a lot of unemployment. These computers will come through, throughout more people. It is when hundreds of millions of people saw that they can at the click of a you know mouse or those, those days there was no mouse, but at least a computer, you can do your booking and not spend the whole day at, uh, at uh, you know, some people used to come, I know in Bombay, in VT and Churchgate, people used to come previous night, spread a towel and sleep there, outside their ticket window. And then they'll be lucky to get the reservation which they wanted. Because by the time their turn came, the booking clerk would say, 
हो गया खत्म हो गया तो नेक्स्ट डे नेक्स्ट डे उसके लिए दूसरा मतलब ये लाइन में लग जाओ ओके सो दैट इज द सिचुएशन टुडे ऑफ कोर्स यू यूज ऐप एंड ऑन अ मोबाइल एंड डू इट राइट इट इज नॉट अ बेनिफिट आल्सो यू डोंट इवन हैव टू गो टू द स्टेशन राइट बट पीपी गुप्ता एंड सीएमसी डिड दैट एंड दैट चेंज द एटीट्यूड ऑफ इंडियंस टुवर्ड्स कंप्यूटर्स एंड टिल रिसेंटली टिल 2009 10 इट वाज द लार्जेस्ट डिजिटल प्रोजेक्ट इन द वर्ल्ड सो इट हैड ग्लोबल इंपैक्ट ओके एंड नाउ ऑफ कोर्स इट इज आधा सो दैट्स व्हाई आई एम शोइंग nandan's name he led that project now about indian it what why india is in the pole position in it services in software development we have to understand this so uh, many people think like the british press uh, who didn't uh, obviously understand anything called them cyber coolies economist and financial times and all these people used to call indian it engineers as cyber coolies okay uh, now uh, of course now they may or not say it, because london underground is run run by indian it london uh, national health service is run by indian it national grid which provides gas and power to uh, uk is uh, run by indian it uh, and so on so forth okay everything, everything in uk is practically run by indian it engineers so uh, now i don't know what they will call that but uh, 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 the basic issue was in the 60s when the computers came and computer applications using computers for business purposes or any other uh, research purposes etc started the programming activity was an individual activity an individual brilliant programmer could write the algorithm flow chart banake algorithm likhke he will program it in whatever language so that's business cobol or algol or fortran or whatever okay or he wants to do more basic work he will do in assembly language etc okay but <coughs> what is the logic he has used what shortcuts he has taken he may be a brilliant guy any other guy would not know and if that fellow leaves the company or leaves the uh, team nobody else will be able to fix that code and definitely he cannot work with 10 other people to solve a problem because his logic is different his logic is different so on so forth so from an artisan's activity a brilliant potter he will make a brilliant pot and if he makes 10 pots i'm sure uh, you know almost all of them will be slightly different from each other there is no standard right it is only in the modern manufacture that when you have assembly line concept when you have standards when you have components okay and uh, 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 and so on that you have standardization when you can break up there is a division of labor when you break up the uh, problem into 10 different sub problems and give the sub problems to 10 different people and create system such that when they integrate they all fit into each other like lego how lego fits in you think it is trivial it's not trivial even if it is half a millimeter difference in sizes that two lego pieces will not fit so you need absolute micro level accuracy for lego to work so similarly this is called modularity in software architecture that if you want several sub systems to fit in together smoothly then you need uh, uh, certain standards you know you need quality checks at each one of those interfaces so that you, you don't find uh, you know any fixing bug fixing you have to do suddenly you find that you have done all this complex code you have written and then it doesn't work or some problems so all these are manufacturing concepts this is what ford did in automobile industry this is what toyota did later called just in time manufacturing distributed manufacturing and so on it is these concepts which initially in tcs and later in other companies which were adopted into it services into programming they created standards they created components they created modularity okay they participated in the ieee standard setting they participated in the, uh, 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 this uh, software research institute in cm cmu which set up the standards for software engineering okay which gives all the cmm level 3 4 5 all these things you know evaluation such etc on how good are your processes and all these things so because indians actually converted uh, artisans activity into industrial activity that is what is called engineering so they converted an art into an engineer and that and then of course the project management and all these other things is what is created a huge human resource base in india which can handle projects in which thousands of engineers can work at the same time 
okay? And these skills are lacking in many other countries, including China. That's why China is very keen to learn this. In fact, initially in the early 2000s, 2004, 5, they were very keen that Indian companies should come to China and uh, establish themselves. They were ready to give free real estate because they had built up whole cities. Here we built one building and call it IT Park. There they have built whole cities. I saw one city with, with uh, you know, dozens and dozens of multi storied buildings, all empty. And then they said there are 35 such cities. But all waiting for companies to come and, uh, you know, invest and uh, develop these things and all that. So one of the things they wanted to learn is all these project management techniques, uh, software engineering and all that. Okay. So they are producing as many or more than us engineers and computer engineers and programmers and so on, coders. But it's not people say things that, oh, because Indians know English, that's what they're doing. Right? So Canadians know English, Australians know English, Irish know English, British know English. So how come they are not leading? Right? People think it is a labor arbitrage. Then you should go to you know Sierra Leone or something. If if labor is the cheapest labor is the only thing, why are people not going to Sierra Leone or Bangladesh or some other country where uh, software engineers may be cheaper? Why they come to India? Why Indian companies are doing well? And not only Indian companies are doing well. IBM has nearly two lakh engineers in India. They don't advertise it because they'll have backlash in the US. <laughs> Every major you know Wall Street bank is here. Every, every other company, telecom company, everybody is here. Huawei is here. Huawei is big center is in Bangalore. Chinese company. All the Japanese companies, Korean companies, everybody is in, in India. Right? And you know, of course, in Hyderabad itself, so many companies are there. Microsoft, Oracle. Why are all these people here? Because there is talent and they also have these skill sets which can, uh, they can work together in teams. You can retrain them, of course. They may not learn it in IITs. But at least later they will learn it uh, by you can train them in the, this company on how to work together and how to do complex projects. Okay, so that is the secret of Indian IT. Okay, now telecom. I'll just run through this. This is a uh, <coughs> Arogi Sami Paul Raj. Uh, he's today a very distinguished professor in Stanford University. He holds the highest number of foundational patents in 4G and 5G. He created a he played a major role in developing a new technology for high throughput uh, telecom uh, called uh, space time multiplexing it's also called mimo multiple input multiple output okay and he is actually indian navy officer he was an indian navy officer and a brilliant person in nda he was stopping everything so navy sent him to do phd in uh, in iit delhi uh, and at that time the war broke out between india and pakistan and uh, indian ship was sunk Right? Indian ship was Ayanis Kukri, I think, the sun uh, in the west coast. And everybody was aghast. You know, how come the ship didn't detect the, the Pakistani submarine coming? What happened to the sonar and all? So, we need a better sonar. So, then he was pulled out of his program in IIT Delhi, sent to Naval Research Lab and, uh, and uh, start working on a new sonar system. So, for the first time, he used digital signal processing techniques to create a sonar. And for many, many years, the sonar that they had developed for Indian Navy turned out to be the best in class in the world. Okay, so he was a brilliant engineer, and then later he headed corporate uh, R and D in BHL, in uh, BEL, even in C dot and uh, etc. He was the first director of CDAC, and then he uh, migrated to US and joined Stanford. He comes to India very often nowadays. He's in the semiconductor uh, committees also, but uh, uh, his, his story is very interesting. And I can tell you stories about each one of them, I don't have the time. Okay. Now, Sam Pitoda, you must have seen his face many places. Uh, he played a stellar role in modernizing Indian telecom uh, infrastructure. So before that, Indian telecom infrastructure was not digital. And to convert it into digital, digital switches, the only choice was to go to uh, large uh, European multinationals, Ericsson, Alcatel, etc. And they were charging millions of dollars for those big switches. So he told Mrs. Gandhi, this was in 82, 83, that he made a presentation. He said, I got some patents in digital switching and uh, in the US. And uh, uh, you know, we can modernize it. We can build our own switch. So later, when Rajiv Gandhi uh, became the prime minister, he encouraged him. And together, they set up 
an institute which was very different at that time called CDOT, Center for Development of Telematics. And it is a CDOT switch which led to digitization of the Indian landline system, telecom system. And today it is the highest, uh, you know, number of, uh, the, the most prevalent uh, switch used anywhere in the world. Highest number of uh, CDOT switches are being used in the world. Because every other developing country wanted that. You got the small switch, it was rated to 256 lines initially. Okay, it was called RACS, rural exchange. Then later they developed it into higher, uh, bigger uh, exchanges, etc. Uh, even up to 10,000 lines and so on. But that laid the foundation. Once you had digital telecom, okay, and then later fiber optic cable, submarine cables and all that, then you didn't have to go to the, uh, to any uh, company or site to deliver your, you could use the fiber optic cables to connect to their computers, log into their computers, do work on their computers, or send whatever you have developed your software there and see its installation and so on. Before that, uh, I'm told in the late 80s, when TCS got a when fantastic uh, opportunity to do work on Swiss bank system, and that won it against very stiff competition from IBM, etc., purely based on their technical uh, architecture, uh, this is a clearing and settlement system called SEGA. Okay, that time, uh, when they started, uh, uh, literally, a guy used to go in the Swiss Air flight from Bombay to Zurich carrying the tapes, okay, to, to, to give to the client. So all this now changed once you have submarine cables, digital telecom and all that. And then later, of course, the, uh, the satellite uh, um, network came in. So through satellites, you could send in the early 90s, it started. VSNL uh, set up uh, all these gateways and, and so on. Okay, so that made networking uh, outsourcing possible. So that meant till that time a computer engineer had to be sent to the site to fix it. There was no other way. But that's no strange thing. Doesn't a doctor do it? Doctor has to go and see the patient. No. Accountant has to come and check your books. No. But people who don't understand it call it, oh yeah, it's a body shot. But that was all you could do. Because you could not remotely log into uh, somebody else's system and work on it. So it is digitization of telecom in India and worldwide, which led to the actual success of services exports, services, globalization of services and so on. So today, we import about $100 billion worth of oil, but we export about $250 billion worth of services. And big chunk of it is in IT services. There are also other services, but about 180 million dollars worth of IT services we are exporting. All that is possible because we have a digital global telecom network. Vishnu Atal, as a PhD from uh, IIC, he uh, thought of a different way of looking at sound. Okay. Now, if you are speaking into a telephone, normally you do frequency analysis of the signal. So. Okay, uh, so, so he said, let me look at the amplitude of these songs. So people thought he was crazy. But he, he, he successfully analyzed using amplitude analysis of sound and created a way of uh, sending a signal at low bit rates and still being clear, which is very important. 64 kbps, forget about it. 16 kbps, 8 kbps. Can you? Can you send a clearly audible signal in that kind of a bandwidth? This technology code. So that is what is called LPC, Linear Predictive Coding. And today every single mobile phone in the world uses a version of his code. One more so, the another product of IIC, PhD, went to Bell Labs. Vishnuatel also worked in Bell Labs. And he developed what is called echo cancellers, which are very important in telecom networks. Again, now it's a multi-billion dollar industry. <coughs> Raj and Neera Singh, both IIT Kanpur. Neera Singh was a chemical engineering uh, student. Raj was uh, electrical engineering. And they, uh, after Raj had finished his PhD, uh, they, they had some time. Neera was still working on her master's thesis. This was 1979-80 period. And then, uh, just then, first mobile license was given in the US. Okay? And uh, they had said, that anybody who knows anything about telecom cannot get a license. Okay? So governments always work in strange ways. So they have decided 
even though Bell Labs, AT&T had developed actually mobile telephony, they cannot bid for mobile telephone license. But anybody who knows anything about telecom cannot because AT&T was a monopoly anyway. Okay? So all Panwalas, Kiranawalas, anybody could get, but not telecom engineers. So one guy had got a network for the Baltimore area, very close to Washington, D.C. D.C. Baltimore area. Uh, he became a later very famous entrepreneur, I forget his name now, Craig something. Uh, and uh, so these people in their spare time developed a, a software to how to do network planning. And they sent it to that fellow and said, maybe you can try this out. So he said, okay, but uh, how much do I pay for this? They said, we had no idea how much to pay, you know. Then, uh, no, 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 you have to tell me how much you have to pay because US, everybody sues everybody else after some time. Okay. So he didn't want to get sued by them. So he said, no, 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 no. I have need a receipt. You have sold it just to me. Then only. So you tell me the price. <coughs> then these people said, arbitrarily, $1,500. Because those days, a PhD scholar used to get about $200 as monthly scholarship, okay? So $1,500 was big time money for them. So they said $1,500. Then they said, what? Uh, okay, in whose, uh, what is your company's name and how do I write the check? They said, what? We don't have a company. We don't have a company account. They said, then I can't, how can you send you, how can I send you the, uh, you know, the check? So they created the company called LCC. Lunage Communication uh, Consultants. Lunaich is a village in Rajasthan from which Rajendra Singh comes. And by 1990s, LCC had designed more than 80% of all the networks in North America and South America. And they had entered the Forbes billionaire list. Okay, and they are doing very well as venture capitalists and other things. They are also doing very well in uh, <coughs> rural development in Rajasthan, etc. Anyway, so now Nan Das was the chief scientist of Oracle. And uh, he played a role in the development of RDBMS, National Database Management System. Okay. Uh, I'll uh, late, so I'm rushing through this networking. Karwal Reiki uh, from IIT Bombay, he, uh, uh, his company, he then developed the first uh, uh, proper uh, switching for the LAN, uh, local area networking. And uh, uh, that became a very successful company called Excelan, later acquired by Novel. Uh, uh, this is a very interesting person. His name is Balamanian. Okay? Uh, he is actually a mechanical engineer from uh, MIT. MIT meaning Madras Institute of Technology, from where uh, President Kalam also uh, graduated. Okay? Now, he went to Rochester to study optics. And there, he said, uh, he said, can I, do, this is 73 around that time. So he said, can I digitize a film? Can I convert a film, picture in a film to a digital file? Now you think it is trivial, right? But he said, at that time nothing existed like that. Like we had to create a scanner, how do you scan, how do you pixelize it, and so on. And then, can I convert from the digital file, can I print that picture on a film? So he developed a technology for that, for biomedical purposes. Suppose somebody takes an X-ray here. Can I send that X-ray to an expert sitting some other place through a, a you know a telephone wire, and then the, the thing can be printed again, and he will look at the X-ray film and make a diagnosis. But then, this was 73, 74, 75 period. Then suddenly, some people in Hollywood, their things, years went up. So George Lucas of Industrial Light and Magic, who created the Star Wars series and made you know, history. And Pixar, these are the two companies which are leading computer graphics in Hollywood. They picked up his patents. So he was the first Indian to get an Oscar. He was given an Oscar in 98-99 for his technical Oscar for contributions to digital cinematography. <laughs> his brother of Narayan Vogel, who used to be chairman of ICICI. Uh, very nice person, did a lot of work later in bioinformatics and so on. Now, theoretical computer science, I don't understand this. Uh, it's too complex, too mathematical. Most computer scientists don't understand this. Okay? But I'm going to flash your uh, faces of uh, some 10, 11 uh, people who have won all the prizes that are available there. The Gödel Prize and Fulkerson Prize and Navan Lena Prize and so on. So, be happy with that. Okay? Uh, uh, Ravi Kandan from IIT Bombay, later in Cornell. 
Rajiv Motwani from IIT Kanpur. He also mentored Google. The foundational paper for Google was written by Rajiv Motwani with uh, brilliant page. Uh, Narendra Karmarka from IIT Bombay. He did the Karmarka algorithm. Uh, Umesh Vajagani in uh, uh, IIT Delhi and later IIT in Berkeley did the uh, important work in quantum computing. Madhusudan, his PhD student from IIT Delhi, uh, again in theoretical computer science. Sanjeev Arora from, uh, uh, I think he studied in uh, one of the IITs or bits, I don't remember, then he transferred abroad. Uh, so he's at Princeton now. Uh, then uh, Love Grover, again IIT Delhi in Bell Labs, he did the lower algorithm, is famous in the search in quantum computing. Manindra Agarwal in IIT Kanpur, he is a pure. IIT Kanpur product, B.Tech and Tech PhD. And he and the work he did with two students, Nitin Saxena and uh, Niraj Kayal. I remember I was in Stanford University interviewing various people and they went there, these people's uh, uh, the paper was published. And there was such a buzz in computer science circles. Oh, you know, uh, what a great work has been done in IIT Kanpur. And that too with two undergraduate students also. So all of them got uh, uh, you know, various uh, uh, what's later? Uh, Subhash Khod from IIT Bombay. Uh, so now I have a couple of more names. One of course is sitting right amidst us. Professor Vijayasagar in control theory. And uh, not only he did uh, fantastic work in control theory when he was in uh, uh, Canada mostly, US and Canada, uh, but later uh, his motherland and President Kalam called him back to India and he came back and he set up the uh, Center for Artificial Intelligence and Robotics in, uh, in uh, Bangalore uh, for DRDO and it is his team which actually developed the, uh, the, the control uh, system for Pages Fighter, okay, it is absolutely uh, world-class uh, Indian products. And then of course he has worked in many other fields. Uh, later he, uh, he also led the R&D work uh, in uh, TCS. He has done work in cryptography, in bioinformatics, uh, and many other fields, machine learning, etc. Okay, so you are lucky you are here to make good use of it. Satellite communication, Pratman Kaur from Bombay, later he went to Berkeley. It is he who developed the VSAT. Concept to be decided. Very small aperture terminal. In storage, Pravin Chaudhary from IIT Delhi, he also got the presets medal. He developed magneto optic memory at IBM Research. Sanjay Marotra from Bits Pilani, uh, later Berkeley, he developed what we use every day, what I am using here, which is thumb drive. Okay? SD, uh, Sandisk, was actually created by him, he was one of the founders. Later, now he is heading Micron. Chairman of Micron, uh, which is now coming back to India uh, and setting up one first uh, uh, Okay. Information theory. Uh, this is Professor Tom Kailar, uh, in Stanford University, uh, one of the leaders in information theory from Pune Engineering College. Uh, he did his uh, uh, BTEC there. And he's a very distinguished professor in Stanford. But uh, not only he's a great theorist and so on, but he thought of some very important problem and solved it in uh, chip industry. Which is that, you know that how to how do you make chips? You, you, you know, you have heard of something called photolithography? How many of you have heard of the name photolithography? Very good, thank you. So, you have a stencil like structure, right? You have a circuit here, and then you you uh, pass light through it, and the image, a small, you have a small film, let us say, you pass light through it. Uh, and then it will, uh, if you have a large one, then you'll, it will focus into a small piece. Or if you have a small one, it can uh, diverge, right? You can use that to print it. That light, it will create the shadows and so on and so forth. Black spaces and shadows. And uh, that is what will be used later uh, to do chemical etching, etc. Right? To create the actual chip you want. Now, what happens? Now, if you want to make smaller, uh, smaller and smaller size chips, smaller and smaller uh, from micron to nanos and so on and so forth, then as you grow, as you go smaller, then your uh, your lines in that stencil will also come closer and closer. 
then if you have lines which are very close and you shine light on it what happens what happens diffraction right you don't get clear shadows you get diffraction so so diffraction will destroy your uh, your uh, chip right so how do you correct for that diffraction you can't keep making smaller and smaller wavelengths of lasers okay so you are reached now ultraviolet nobody has discovered x ray laser yet so as you go you can reduce the wavelength but there's a limit to it but then if you want to prevent diffraction how do you correct for diffraction so he created the theory for that okay and uh, he even started a startup so he's one of the few academics who, uh, other than amar bose who actually used his theory knowledge to create a startup called numerical technologies which was later uh, bought up by uh, intel and uh, his uh, ideas are being very much used in the business okay uh, that's it thank you uh, these are some references <laughs> Uh, are very good uh, to read. That's it. Guys, kindly stay seated. Those of you who want NSS hours, make a line. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you, sir, and it's a very nice lecture. So, for something you are in the center of time, please go. We give up five minutes for the audience to sit down. And if you have any questions or comments, you can ask them. Uh, are there any questions or questions for the audience? Okay, so I think there are some microphones arranged for the audience. So, and we have microphones here. So, it's not always easy for us in the front to hear the question being asked in the back. So, please wait until the microphone comes to you. That way, everybody in the room can uh, listen to your question. So, who wants to be the brave person to ask the first question? Thank you. Ah, okay. Just wait for the mic. Sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. It is very interesting to know all this information. I would like to know what is your view of the uh, current uh, semiconductor mission and the current uh, uh, quantum mission of India and how do you see it and uh, how competitive we are in respect to the other you know, uh, countries. Uh, they are already in semiconductor for a long time. So how we can play an important role with this current mission? <laughs> no, but it is probably better qualified to answer many of these questions. Uh, I think we have to wait. And we have the potential to do many things, but unless we have something to show, we can't talk about you know how good it will be or not so good or what quality it will be. So we should not talk too much. We have a tendency to talk too much before we do anything. So let's do something and then we'll talk. Now, without money, you can't do anything. <laughs> um, see, where the goal has come to, it literally becomes like an arms race. In the sense that, uh, Shivana mentioned uh, NVIDIA company. So, uh, NASCOM, which is a national software uh, in industry, they did a census of how many NVIDIA workstations there are in India. How many workstations are in all of India? And the answer was 636, something like that. These are not the latest. This is from the very first one to the one here. Just about two months ago, Facebook, or Meta, whichever name you want to use, they placed an order for 25,000 latest NVIDIA works. One company. And all of India with 650 works. How many companies? You can't. So somehow our um, government is not allied to it. We want to quantum company. That is another arms race. 
least the kind of research that can be done with pencil and paper is wrong. Uh, like Manindra or one of the, Manindra Agro, as we mentioned, was one of the pioneers in the case. But that case is over. Now we want to build an actual concept that can take money. And we're not willing to invest money. So all of you people should start putting some pressure to uh, force the government to make bigger financial commitments. Either everything is clear or you are totally dazed. <laughs> Information overload of that. No. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Wonderful talk and then inspiring to see that many Indians contributed to where we are today. So I hope many of them. Okay, we'll continue. So one question, again, uh, kind of in similar lines, but for the Indian Senegal Revolution, it's not just like uh, creating a fab, it's like you need to uh, create a complete ecosystem. Do you think that we are, um, do we have the capability to create the complete ecosystem along with the fab? Again, I think it's too early to talk. We already have very large number of chip designers. And I'm sure there are also people who are doing testing. Okay. What we lack is actual skills in the process part of it. And there are multiple skills in that, in materials, in chemistry, in uh, even things like effluent control. Okay, because most toxic chemicals are used in chip industry and so on and so forth. Okay. So uh, actually ideal situation would be let it all be done in China or Korea or some other place and we'll just design and get our things printed. But because of the geopolitical situation, it is becoming necessary, it is the, th the thinking is that many countries want to also have FAPs. It's not just us. Even the US doesn't have state-of-the-art FAPs now. They are all in Taiwan and with TSMC. So US itself is, has got a 50 billion uh, program and they are giving tens of billions of dollars in subsidy to chip industry to set up state-of-the-art FAPs there, which might take another five years, ten years, you don't know. It takes time. Okay, and uh, even Europe is uh, worried about all these things. So, this is the, you can say, deglobalization has happened because of geopolitical situation. Otherwise, ideally, like you have division of labor in everything else, which is the most efficient way of producing, division of labor uh, in fabrication and fabless uh, uh, chip companies. And fabless chip companies were so valued high by Wall Street that analysts used to call them fabulous chip companies. Okay. So, we have to create both sides, but hopefully with this new uh, initiatives and important thing is not only government, but private sector like Tata's and others are uh, interested in investing in it and creating the ecosystem. So, it will take another 5 years, 10 years to develop the ecosystem. How did the uh, ecosystem develop in IT services? It did happen, it started in 68, 69 with uh, TCS. Today, it is in that pace, it is more than 60 years, right? 55 years at least. So, it will take time, uh, but necessity is the mother of invention. So new, newer entrepreneurs will come up. So whole uh, you know supply chain, all the vendors, various types will come up. Services people will also come up. Okay, I'll tell you how delicate this issue is. There was a time when chip industry was in trouble because a particular glue was not available, and that glue was very crucial in the chip industry. And only one company, I think, in Japan or China, which was making it. And some problem was there in that company. So, these, these uh, supply chains are very complex. But even, even today, there is only one company in Holland that makes the ultraviolet uh, integrity machine, right? <coughs> if that company decides to ban <coughs> India, for example, then we'll be in trouble. So, uh, you yourself mentioned that only 20% of the value is in fabrication. So you are basically saying that the 20% is for strategic reasons, not for commercial reasons. Is that a kind of thing? Absolutely. Keep my clue, okay. So uh, what, what you said was that uh, only 20% of the value comes from chip manufacture, 80% is from design and so forth. So I asked him, are we investing in that last 20% only for strategic reasons? And he said yes. So it's not like that. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Okay. Then other thing, other thing is uh, even for innovation. Let us say uh, somebody told me, Bits Pilani, when I was visiting them, they told me that they created one particular asset. Okay, application specific privacy. Now, obviously, you are not going to make 10 billion of them, right? You want to test it out and use it in services. So maybe you want 5,000, 10,000. Now, you want to send that design to some fab in uh, Korea or uh, Taiwan or somewhere. Who will change their whole product line just to like uh, produce 5,000 chips? Then obviously they will charge a huge fee, first of all. They have to schedule it in their production and then they will charge a huge fee. It will become untenable for an uh, academic institution. But if you have a fab, which if not for commercial production, at least available for research purposes. Like they are planning now in semiconductor complex in Chandigarh. They are talking about setting up an uh, ecosystem for research purposes. Then all the IITs, NITs, all the colleges, where they are doing anything in semiconductors and design, they can test out their design actually make the chips. Sure. So that will increase the innovation in the in our own uh, design. Now we say we are proud that we have 40,000 chip designers. That's the estimate. Okay, highest number probably in the world. But almost all of them are working for Intel or Motorola or somebody else. There are hardly any Indian chip companies. Uh, you know, which are uh, making those uh, cutting edge chips. Mm -hmm. So, in future, maybe startups will come up doing things and they can test out their ideas. Mm -hmm. After all, startups don't have uh, millions of dollars to uh, get uh, large numbers. All these things. So, that cycle will also start. Anyway, uh, next question. Uh, this question is uh, uh, sir, so. So whatever inventions or uh, groundbreak, groundbreaking innovations you have mentioned in the past 50 to 100 years, uh, so there have been computer science, uh, semiconductor industry, telecom, internet, etc. So will there be more such innovations in the uh, coming near future? Because it's all, uh, I think all of it is uh, uh, till now not set in stone, but it has been a lot of you know, uh, improvement since the past 50 to 100 years. So, will there be more such things in these fields, in these fundamental fields, or uh, the more uh, innovations will come in AI uh, or machine learning or whatever we have been uh, talking about in the past five years or a decade? So, of course, they will come. Because uh, what they will be and in which areas they will be, I can't say. See, there is always a phase when an industry matures and reaches a certain scale that you feel that it is plateauing, feel that ideas are stagnating. For example, in 19th century, end of 19th century, all physicists thought that all they need to do is calculate the next decimal place. Okay? Then suddenly the quantum revolution happened, everything changed. Right? So, there are bound to be, you feel that only you have to do the, from 4 nanometers, you will have to go to 3 and 2 nanometers, etc. Okay? In